Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So um, let's consider this these names Billy the Kid, the Joker, Annie Hall, Antoine Donnell, Holly Golightly, Sugar Cane, Anton Sugar, the Joker, Emily Vijay Chauhan, Jack Sparrow, Professor Higgins, Raju the Guide, Scarlett O'Hara, Tyler Durden. What is common among all these people or all these names? Well, I think you guess that these are great cinematic characters okay. and why do we still refer to them? I mean Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind, Tyler Durden from Fight Club, Raju the Guide from Vijay Anand's Guide based on R.K. Narayan's famous novel. You have Holly Golightly from Breakfast at Tiffany's and Sugar Cane from Some Like It Hot, Marilyn Monroe playing Sugar Cane, the quintessential dumb blonde that was her image, Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean, Professor Higgins and of course Eliza Doolittle from My Fair Lady. Now why are we interested in these names? Antoine Donnell we have already talked about, 400 Blows that is a true false film. We have also talked about uh, Emily and why are we interested in all these names? These are great characters okay? and char great characters always remain with us. You, rem you think of a movie, you, th you remember a movie for a variety of reasons. If it, there is a strong characterization, the film always remains with you. So what makes a character interesting? Now uh, all these characters they are not necessarily morally good characters. So we are not talking about good versus evil. I mean when you think of a character like Anton Shigar from No Country from old Man, for Old Men. So he you know he is a walking devil, Satan himself. We are not interested uh, in characters who are only morally good or morally upright characters. Atticus Finch for example, he is the essential, quintessential good guy that I am talking about to kill a mockingbird. So I am talking about characters who are interesting, who have stayed in our collective consciousness um, over a period of uh, several decades. And uh, so we have been talking about cinema and the history of cinema. So what we are interested in are what makes a character interesting. See, we are we are halfway through the course and it is in essential to understand. We have been talking about various movements. We have also talked about um, uh, cinematic theory, cinematic concepts. We have also talked about the studio years. So, um, and film genres, film theory. So, several things have been discussed in this course. We have also talked about various dimensions of plot. So, what now there cannot be any plot without a character that goes without saying. So, cinema largely depends on it is important that we know the people behind the camera, but we should also in, spare some thought for people who are in front of the camera. I mean throughout this course I have been largely talking about people behind the camera. So the editors, the directors, the filmmakers, the studios, the producers. Uh, this session is specifically devoted to the great characters and uh, the films that have immortalized these great characters. Now um, the idea of discussing characters is nothing new. We know that in poetics Aristotle uh, that was in 4th century BC clearly articulated the requisites of 
a hero. He talked about the ideal tragic hero and paved the way for character analysis. Um, an ideal tragic hero according to the Greek philosopher embodies complexities uh, although he must be an essentially good man with a fatal flaw. For uh, Aristotle this term is hamartia. In the classical Greek theatre a character was defined and explained by the mask he wore. So, they would essentially wear a mask um, perhaps you know a sad look a sad mask uh, smiling mask. So, sh uh, to show perhaps uh, uh, the happy feelings I mean Greek theatre uh, was an enormous space and people who sat at the back okay, uh, at far behind, they would not uh, be able to see the characters or the actors in acting a particular character and their emotions. So, it was essential that these people, these spectators should identify characters by the mask they wore. Now, um, this led to certain kind of stereotyping and stereotyping remains so for a, uh, I mean let us say even till uh, the beginning of the 20th century in, in uh, theatre and literature and also we are now we are talking about cinema. So, for a long time in cinema too we had this idea of stereotyping, but here we are interesting in such characters which are um, essentially multi dimensional dynamic characters. So, characters that are dynamic are interesting. So, that is the concept that we are going to discuss today when flat characters and static characters can also be uh, interesting, but then it takes a particular kind of a film to make such characters interesting. Most of by and large we are interested or we are concerned with those characters uh, that are well rounded, well sketched, well developed and have an edge to them. Theoretically, um, E. M. Foster in uh, aspects of the novel discriminates between flat and round characters. According to Forrest, uh, Foster, a flat character is a type, a stock or two dimensional. Um, so, Foster spelling F O R S T E R, you can uh, look E. M. Foster and his aspects of the novel to know more about this. According to Forster, a flat character is a type. Okay, so we have been talking about stereotyped characters, which are two-dimensional, which do not have an edge to them or any uh, further personality to them. Good characters are essentially good. Bad characters are essentially bad. You can uh, always refer to, um, for example, most of the TV series characters that we watch. So these are essentially flat characters. So, you have the scheming daughter-in-law or the long-suffering daughter-in-law and a very unidimensional kind of uh, uh, you know the patriarch, the head of the family, the husband, the father-in-law. Generally, they do not have in many of the series that we are watching nowadays, so they do not have much to do. So, we, I am basically talking about uh, the very commercial mainstream kind of TV series that are on air. Um, especially in our country. So, this is what so what uh, uh, they these characters too serve a kind of purpose, but we are not talking about what we are saying is that flat character essentially remains uninteresting. They do not have much of detailing okay, or uh, uh, individualizing. So, the writer or uh, the filmmaker is not particularly interested in giving any details to these characters. Flat characters can also be described in a single phrase or sentence. For example, we say a good character, a scheming character, a villain, villainous character or a suffering character etcetera. So, these characters can be described in a single phrase or sentence. On the other hand, as uh, Forster tells us, a round character is complex in his motivation or treatment. He is represented with subtle peculiarities and has uh, such a character is difficult to describe with any adequacy like any person in real life. 
a well rounded character is always capable of surprising us that means that there are hidden facets to this character from here we uh, move on to from foster we i'll uh, take you a little backward in time that is henry james and his art of fiction which was published way back in 1884 now henry james tells us about telling characters where the author the writer intervenes authoritatively in order to describe and to evaluate the motives and dispositional qualities of the character for example jane austen does it very frequently for her characters if you read her novel pride and prejudice you will understand that she tells us what to make out of her characters showing characters which is also called dramatic method and this is henry james's second category of characters and he tells us that here readers are expected to infer what motives and dispositions lie behind what the characters say or do now if you apply this idea to the character that we are doing here so uh, in a character such as holly go lightly or in a character such as anton sugar you are you uh, as a, a film watcher you are expected to infer what drives these characters okay so it is important that we understand these things the, these distinctions many a time we are just told a lot of things are told to us about um, a character for example if you think of suraj varjatya's films characters in his films now we are often told a lot about characters before they arrive on the scene you know in maine pyar kiya aur hum saath saath hain aur even hum aapke hain kaun so much is said you know um, he is uh, for example we are told that he is a very innocent boy or the girl she is uh, you know very chaste and uh, ab- absolutely like uh, you know uh, a docile a submissive kind of a girl very obedient so these things are told to us okay they are not just shown to us we are not supposed to infer because these are a different set of movies catering to a uh, a particular set of audiences and those audiences constantly need to be told what is happening when we talk about literature or cinema or any art of superior intellect then we have to understand that there the artist is not going to go at lens or be at pains to explain every detail every motivation and every characteristic of the plot or the character he just shows uh, them to you and it's left to you to infer i would also like to refer to director frank capra whose works we have been uh, referring to constantly here he talks about how characters serve to involve an audience um for capra you have to give them something to worry about some person to worry about and care about and you have got them involved so audiences are involved when you give them someone to care about or someone to get involved with and let's think of a movie such as uh, um, it's a wonderful life directed by capra okay and there james stewart's character now he is a small town businessman his business is uh, about to finish he blames the world around him and he also contemplates committing suicide but the, but then there is a guardian angel who comes along and he tells him all the good things that the character has done throughout his life in that small town and how many lives he has touched now through that now it's a very ki- uh, telling kind of a character you know you are not being shown you are told a uh, constantly but then that's frank capra that is very sentimental and uh, quite unsubtle so but the idea is that you have to care about a character and that we do about james stewart character now consider another james stewart character from hitchcock's vertigo we have been uh, discussing vertigo also mm, throughout this course now what happens in vertigo he is a very complex character he is not easy to understand hitchcock shows us the character he doesn't tell you much about the character except that 
how he developed uh, his fear of heights, how his vertigo. That is all. Apart from that, much is left to the audience to decide. In psycho, however, the motivation and the psychological complexities of the character, they are all revealed at the end of the film when there is an elaborate description or uh, explanation of the character's misdeeds, uh, Norman Bates and why he, why a character like him becomes a killer, a serial killer. So, his psychoses are explained at length in the court of law. So, um, that was something that uh, critics really uh, found quite uh, disturbing, because uh, had uh, he left th certain things unsaid, then it is believed that Hitchcock's Psycho would have been a greater film. So, again we are talking about showing character and telling character. Now, uh, um, a thing that uh, usually marks a character is his or her accent, dialect, vocabulary and grammar. These things tell us about the character's background including socio-economic level, education and mental processes. So, a character in a cop drama or a gangster saga will speak very differently from the protagonist, for example, in a martial arts film or a samurai film or in a comedy. Appearances also make a lot of difference. Here I am going to show you a wonderful clipping from um, Coen Brothers Fargo starring Francis McDermott. Watch this uh, particular sequence and understand uh, how her accent, dialect and her appearance shape the, the kind of character she is. Characters can also be understood through action. So, action could be external or internal. Uh, so, for example, I can give you exam uh, names such as uh, Schwarzenegger's commander or uh, even terminator. It is Schwarzenegger and he does what comes naturally to the character. It is Sylvester Stallone and when we watch him in Rocky or Rambo, then they do what comes very naturally to them. Okay? They are, these are action heroes. John McClane in Die Hard, he does what is expected of him. Okay? It's, uh, uh, in Bruce Willis's uh, uh, Die Hard character, John McClane character, uh, of course, uh, we also get a tinge of humor that was also possible, that was also present in Terminator. So, those things give an added dimension to the character, but by and large we know what to expect from them and these characters define themselves through their external actions. Now, internal actions, let us think again, let us go back again to Vertigo and James Stewart character and Anthony Perkinson's character in Psycho. Now, the, these characters have certain secret desires, aspirations motivated by some deep psychological uh, motives okay, or actions. So, those things define these characters and many a time they are informed by visual and oral metaphors. When we look at the shot of Anthony Perkins standing in his motel with a stuffed bird uh, on the wall, and then we have to understand that what uh, the, the, the director is trying to tell us something about the character. Now, internal action again as I have been telling you about a character, how he is motivated, how she is motivated is um, he is all driv driven by psychological complexities. We have been talking about Scorsese's characters, for example, Travis Bickle and the character who talks to himself and he says, you talking to me, that is De Niro in Taxi Driver. So, uh, watch that particular scene, you talking to me and action and observe how, how action takes place internally. His externally it does happen, but much of the action takes place internally. Therefore, the constant use of voice over in taxi driver and also in mean streets. So, we have also done clippings from mean streets and Harvey Ketel's character who is uh, uh, in a state of dilemma uh, between his uh, loyalty towards his friends and his belief 
in his Catholic faith. So, these characters are psychologically complex, multi layered and multi dimensional and they are all driven through internal action. Internal action of characters is projected through secrets, aspirations, memories, dreams and fantasies. We have to also assume that real characters are more than mere instruments of the plot that they do what they do for a purpose out of motives that are consistent with their overall personality. So, the, these when these characters uh, are shown to us we call them more real otherwise when the as soon as this, uh, a character starts acting out of character we call them unreal characters. Names also define a character uh, observe for instance um, Val Kilmer's character in Saint and the kinds of personalities he assumes the identities he assumes. So, names can be evocative symbolic they can also be ironic at times. Um, for example, think of uh, Daniel Day Lewis's character in the last of the Mohicans, he is Hawkeye. Why do you think he is called Hawkeye? Um, an interesting device that many filmmakers adapt or adopt for making uh, characters more interesting is uh, making us read these characters through multiple perspectives. So, one such device is followed in Citizen Kane, where the dying hero says Rosebud and then a journalist is on the trail. Why did this rich, influential and powerful man had only one word on his lips before dying that is Rosebud and that one word gives us clue to the character. Velvet Gold Mine is another interesting film, a more recent film. You should watch this film uh, in order to understand and they uh, how the director has followed the multiple perspective device in order to portray a character. Static characters where nothing much happens where they are uh, you know a, a character who drinks is always shown as a compulsive drunkard. For example, uh, the, uh, the movie directed by Robert Redford River runs through it. So, you have the character of Paul who is impetuous, he gets involved in card games, wants nothing more than to stay in Montana his, and work for a newspaper. Dynamic characters, so um, on the other hand uh, we have been talking about a static character, so dynamic characters is the opposite and these characters undergo personality change. Now, think ex for example, Michael Corleone as played by Al Pacino in The Godfather. Now, he becomes wiser, mature, perhaps more sinister, perhaps more responsible, more self-confident by the end of the movie. Julia Roberts character too at the end of Erin Brockovich, she becomes a, a person who is transformed. She starts off as a nervous, very shaky kind of a character and by the end of it when she has exposed a major uh, corruption in her small town, she is much more self confident and self reliant. Okay. Sleeping with the enemy again starring Julia Roberts is another example of a dynamic character. Dynamic characters are essential for serious drama. Comedy may not require too much of dynamism or change. Think uh, Charlie Chaplin's constant persona, frequent persona of uh, the tramp, Raj Kapoor the tramp, always the quint quintessential innocent uh, and innocent uh, particularly caught among the corrupt forces, corrupt city forces in both these cases. So, while dynamic uh, characters are essential for serious drama, comedy does not require, comic characters do not require too much of dynamism. Otherwise, uh, the element of surprise would not be too helpful to create the comic effect. So, what we have been learning flat characters, they are two dimensional, predictable, they lack complexity and psychological depth. Uh, however, their repetitive behavior makes for comedy. So, for comedy comic characters 
we need flat characters they who generally represent character types mr bean kind of character so and a round character is a completely opposite multi dimensional unpredictable and they are saturated or imbued with psychological depth think of malan brando in on the waterfront and james dean in rebel without a cause and observe how these characters evolve change and show edges to their character throughout through the course of the film again also uh, for example think of saturday night fever and raging bull these films we have been discussing and if you watch these films you will um, understand how these characters evolve and change so these are dynamic characters however we have a very popular franchise oceans 11 oceans franchise oceans 11 12 13 and the franchise the characters here do not evolve they are not dynamic but then that is essential to retain the flavor of the franchise so we have to make these distinctions If the characters don't change why is it that don't they don't change okay it's not because the uh, actors are not good enough or that screenwriter is not good enough or the director doesn't have too many ideas but in a franchise it is always useful to have uh, a hint of flatness so that the audiences get what they expect that's the beauty of a franchise stereotypical characters are other set of characters we have the courtesan with a heart of gold as we have all often seen in our uh, uh, discussions of uh, uh, films such as uh, devdas mukaddar ka sikandar umrao jaan golden hearted prostitute or courtesan we also have the stereotype of alcoholic lover for example devdas and mukaddar ka sikandar and many more such films so these are stereotypical characters we also have another interesting category of characters that are enigmatic characters now uh, think of juliet binoche's character in chocolat she is mysterious not much is known about her past and that's uh, what constitutes the beauty of her character the interest in her character um, another similar character is ben wishaw's character in perfume the story of a murderer we know something about his background but he still remains an extremely enigmatic character he doesn't speak too much and we are forever left to search for his motives here watch a clipping from usual suspects the kaiser soze clipping and consider how verbal clint emerges as a very enigmatic character although he is not supposed to be there is also when uh, uh, um, when we talk about characters we also refer to dramatic foils now what are foils f o i l s foils these are contrasting characters for example in harold and maud if you watch this particular film harold and maud you will understand that uh, this is a love story between an 80 year old woman and a 20 year old boy so these are contrasting characters with different attitude towards life again foils are also jay and viru's characters in shole these are contrasting characters they have very little in common however they complement each other beautifully we uh, foil characters can be good versus evil and strong versus silent loud versus flamboyant and this also adds an added you know a kind of a dimension to the character the to char- character sketch of the film it is also very common in the cop buddy films miami vice and um, 48 hours and also lethal weapon so contrasting sense of attributes in two characters so they in other words they complement each other here is a clipping from the dark night so what uh, we have observed here is that 
the Joker literally telling the Dark Knight, Batman, the hero, that mm, the two of them are sort of, uh, you know, complementary to each other. One cannot exist without the other. So, in other words, they act as foils to each other. Foils again are very common in buddy films. We have already talked about the cop drama in buddy films also. For example, Rain Man, Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman and in Midnight Run, watch uh, uh, Robert De Niro and Charles Grothin. So, these two actors playing perfect foil to each other. One of the most effective techniques of characterization thus is the foil. It contrasts characters and we are fascinated drawn to them because of uh, the contrast in their attitude, behavior, opinions, lifestyle, physical appearance and so on. So, Lauren and Hardy okay, and that uh, you know brings an element of interest to the characters. We can also think of you know Fenster and Verbal Clint in the usual suspects and how different they are from each other as well as from Dean Keaton who is as suave and sophisticated as they come. Now, um, filmmakers also often uh, resort to using caricatures and late motifs to develop a character. Um, now, uh, a character such as uh, the lead character in Sunset Boulevard, which we have been talking about quite frequently in this course. So, here we have this fading actress who refuses to believe that her time is up and she still feels that there is a legion of fans waiting outside her mansion. So, she is deliberately given, um, Billy Wilder and his screenwriters deliberately give Gloria Sons and exaggerated features and exaggerated lines over the top lines in order to uh, make her look like a caricature of her former self. Caricatures can be comic as well as tragic. Late motive, however, refers to repetition of a single action, gesture, phrase, idea by a character. In Shole, you remember Amitabh Bachchan's Jai often uses a coin to decide whether they should go ahead with a job or not. So, that coin becomes a sort of late motive to that character. And at the end, we know how important that uh, our role that coin plays in their lives. The late motif is also a kind of a trademark and it can all you can also have a piece of music that is used repeatedly to define a character. For example, James Bond, the flute in Kill Bill part 2, Mission Impossible theme, the Godfather theme. So, all these are pieces of music that act as late motif. A catchphrase such as I will be back that is Schwarzenegger telling you in Terminator that also becomes a character slate motif and you know how successfully that line has been played uh, even in subsequent films. Um, filmmakers also use allegorical characters. So, we have allegorical good and bad uh, um, characters taken from our own epics and in America during the 50s there was a film called High Noon, which alludes to the McCarthy period in the persona of the sheriff as played by um, Gary Cooper. Uh, we have other set of characters which are more diffi uh, difficult to understand, more abstract in construction, but is still interesting if you look at them that way. So, Ingmar Bergman's films are known for uh, moral dialectics and philosophical characters. If you want to know more about those characters, you must watch Persona, Seventh Seal and also Wild Strawberries. So, Ingmar Bergman's characters and films are known for their philosophical inclin inclinations. The Seventh Seal, for example, one of the most important films of Bergman is a cinematic model of existentialism. A person's a character's apocalyptic search for meaning. He is played by a knight who is in search of meaning of life. So, this tale is about uh, a hero that is the knight who challenges death 
and death is an allegory, it takes an alleg allegorical interpretation. And uh, there is a game of chess between the night and death. So, although this film is about understanding uh, people and themselves in terms of philosophical questions, Bergman also wants the audience to experience the film with the issue of the problems of evil, philosophy of religion, a very existentialist movie and it should be watched through that perspective. So, several films, several characters and uh, eventually when you read a film or you want to understand a film or even if you want to write a screenplay, think along these lines. So, thank you very much. We will meet for our next class.